arrest and incarceration are very blunt tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have lots of evidence that these tools are overused in our current society. And so before you make something a crime, you need to have a really high bar for how certain you are that this is worth ruining a person's life and ruining their family's life. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still in Cambridge in Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about criminal justice reform. We have Elizabeth Edwards joining us on the show. Hello. Hi. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. We're really excited. We're gonna have a lot of great conversation. Elizabeth's background is epic. She spent four years as a representative in New Hampshire's legislature from 2014 to 2018. Her main focus was criminal justice reform and she was the first representative to sponsor a bill that would decriminalize sex work. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of that journey and harm reduction, prison, civil liberties. Very excited to get into this. All right, Elizabeth, let's start things off with your journey. You know, who, who, who are you? How did you become who you are today? Yeah, um, I think that a, my interest in politics stemmed from conversations with my father from a very young age. We listened to a lot of talk radio, we watched a lot of news, and he was always very interested in my opinion. I think starting in second grade, I would get into arguments with my teacher about when it seemed like they had some kind of political slant. Um, so I've always been, but I still managed to pull off being the teacher's pet somehow. <laughs> um, so that was, um, that was who I was from a young age. I wanted to be a, a Supreme Court justice in middle school. That was my career aspiration back then. Um, so I've always cared a lot about politics. And then in college, I became an anarchist. Yeah, this is a wild turn in the story. A quick point is that it's cool that you and your father had so many, so much discourse around news and politics growing up because that's a good way to get engaged with what's happening in the world, get the kids engaged, and especially when the adults are hearing out the young people's opinions and ideas. Yeah, sure. Although there's always the nature versus nurture question, right? Like my sister barely cares at all about politics. So is it my dad's, is it my dad's genes? Is that why we care about this stuff? Or is it the conversations we had, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Your sister doesn't care as Not much. Not really, yeah. no. She, I, like, uh, I don't think she even voted. You were like really engaged and she was not engaging in the political conversations with him as much. Um, I don't know, uh, it's hard to say. There's like, like I, I remember my conversations with him and I think, he, and he tried to get her interested, certainly, yeah. because it's what he's passionate about. Um, but uh, she wasn't saying she wanted to be a no, Supreme Court justice. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then anarchist in, in college, yeah. which was interesting. Okay. Yeah. And this was in uh, New York. Yeah. I went to um, a state university of New York, uh, the college at Brockport, which is where I met my wife. Um, and I think that when I started college, okay. So when I started college, I was in ROTC. And I wanted, yeah. <laughs> this is an interesting, it's pretty, it's a pretty interesting evolution. So I was in ROTC and I had political beliefs that were pretty close to my dad's political beliefs, which was um, kind of like a pre-Trump, obviously, kind of like a small government conservative almost. And um, like socially liberal, fiscally conservative, but also very um, kind of hawkish on foreign policy um, and so I wanted to join the military to fight the terrorists and that's how I was when I joined well that's what I thought was like at the time I was like a proto um, proto EA uh, that's the conference we're at right now mm -hmm. is uh, EAGX and effective altruism right yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's always like well what is the um, what is the best way that I can um, 
make the world a better place is basically the central question of EA. And I had never heard of EA at this time, of course, but a lot of people answer that question with, I want to join the military. Um, and so that was my plan. And then it's a good thing that I left ROTC after a year, um, largely because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in my relationship with my girlfriend at the time. Um, well, can you teach us about that policy? Right, and, Don't yeah. Ask, Don't Tell said that you're allowed to have um, gay feelings as long as nobody finds out about it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so that was really rough being a college student. My first real relationship, my first real romantic relationship was with another girl and the campus was my home where I, you know, I'd go to the dining hall and I couldn't show physical affection to her because other cadets could be in the dining hall. And so I only, I only lasted in ROTC for a year before I left. And it was very convenient that I did leave because it would have been really awkward to be a senior and an anarchist and in ROTC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is, this is, is this policy still in? in no, yeah. don't ask, don't tell was repealed. Um, Who was it implemented by and why? Bill Clinton. Wow. It was seen as an, because the, for, because the, um, the previous policy was you have to like for to to get to, to join the military you have to forswear any kind of homosexual feelings or conduct so this was like it's okay to be a homosexual as long as you don't talk about it so it was actually it was a step in the right it direction. was a step in the right direction in the early 90s um wow wow so you couldn't you actually when you joined pre-clinton you pre-clinton they would ask you are you a homosexual Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, and that would disqualify you. Yep. Damn, this is some old code. Yeah. Some it's old. It's old pretty code. old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's good to see us moving in new code. Yeah, into new code. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, and so is there now a new policy in place that is like you can do, be whoever you Yeah, the, it's the, the, I mean, there are still like rules of conduct around um, like, sex and romance in the military like for example like um adultery is strongly punished in the military but you can but the same rules apply to gay relationships as straight relationships okay so you, you there's now um you can openly uh, be gay yeah you can be openly gay oh that's yeah a huge step in oh yeah right that's yeah. much wow. better I wow think. yeah yeah cool okay great thank you for teaching us about that sure okay all right, so then, uh, so then, you know, you, what, what was this whole anarchist? Okay, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so basically, I had like the makings of a little, um, of like a libertarian, except that I thought like a strong national defense was essential for protect for spreading democracy abroad and um, protecting America and killing bad people, um, and uh, and then I read a book by Ron Paul uh, and it basically explained the concept of blowback in a way I found really convincing that um, American foreign policy creates conflict and creates terrorists and does more harm than good which again goes back to me being sort of like a proto EA is that like well does this satisfy a cost-benefit analysis um, and yeah. I think and I and I was convinced by Ron Paul's book that the answer was no, and so it was like, well, if you don't even need a government for to, um, you know, to have a strong military, then at that point I was like, well, what do you even need a government for? I read another book called Healing Our World in an Age of Aggression, which is a very peace and love title. It's by a woman named Dr. Mary Ruart, and that book um, laid out um, basically why you should. Uh, the moral and consequentialist case for never using government for anything, for any aim whatsoever. Um, Interesting. And like always using private industry for like maybe? Yeah, private action, private okay. action, yeah. private charity, all that stuff for everything. Interesting. And I found that book very convincing. I didn't, uh, uh, pr probably because it accorded with my beliefs, it, with the way that my beliefs were already leaning at the time, right? Um, and that was the last 
basically the last straw. Um, another thing that was going on around that time was that um, it was the 2008 presidential election and I really wanted to vote in it because it was the first year I could vote. Uh, and um, I was a junior in college at this point. And the, I didn't want to vote for uh, John McCain or Barack Obama. Um, and I watched the, especially because I, after watching the vice presidential debate, it, about five minutes in, it made me cry. I started crying watching Sarah Palin and uh, Joe Biden give the same answer to a question, like the same completely meaningless answer, um, full of like populist drivel to a question about preventing future financial crises. Mm -hmm. And I started crying with despair for the future of the country and my, um, my girlfriend, uh, turned the TV off in our dorm <laughs> and so I didn't have any hope I was like there's no hope for America and I still wanted to vote so I started researching third parties and I was I went down the Wikipedia rabbit hole and that's how I found out about um, the Free State Project okay cool all right so quick pre Free State Project I think what you brought up is so interesting about how some of the actions that have been taken throughout time, even all, let's say, six million years of this human evolution, that whenever we think that we're, you know, going in and making an intervention in someone else's life and their, and their land and their peace and dignity, that sometimes these these recoils happen that are worse, that make things worse than just having, somehow being able to have a discourse about it and just be at peace. Yeah, um, yeah, making decisions for other people is a very fraught and dangerous activity. Um, at this point in my life, I think that sometimes we should do it anyway, but um, with a lot of caution. Interesting, and could you maybe give us an idea of what that would look like? Um, sure, like um, I think uh, publicly funded vaccination programs are a good example of this. Uh, coordination, any kind of coordination problem um, where uh, any one person would be worse off doing the thing, but everybody would be better off if everybody did the thing. That's a coordination problem and it's a good candidate for um, a type of thing that the government ought to do. Oh, interesting. Okay, so the coordination problems where everyone's better off if they if we all do like the, no one ever kills anyone, like things like that. Are well, more I think a, a really good example is like um, uh, like air and water pollution. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Is because like I would be better off if I like created a product and sent and created externalities that I didn't really have to worry about. Like, you know, when I pollute the air with my economic output, I only face, you know, one seven billionth of the cost of that, whereas I get all of the profits for myself. Yeah. So this is clearly a coordination problem because everybody has the incentive to um, profit at the expense of air and water, simply because um, the air and water are, um, it's very difficult to internalize those externalities, right? So I think air and water pollution is something that the private sector can't really solve. Now on the other hand, you always have to ask yourself, is the government also polluting our air and water? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not just private actors, so. Um, How do we treat the air and the water and our biosphere as a public good um, that we, harmonize with yeah yeah completely interesting okay so then it was the the free the free state project state project and you heard about that in new york and then you moved to new hampshire yeah so i found out about the free state project and i thought oh good i don't have to worry about the country as a whole like obviously the country as a whole is um is too hard it's too much um so i'm just going to these people have this idea to just focus on one state and they voted and they picked New Hampshire. So all of the uh, liberty activists, which is what um, 
free staters often refer to themselves as, are going to move to New Hampshire and we're going to at least create an island of as little government as possible or preserve, or in a lot of cases, just preserve the small government ethos that New Hampshire already has because it is a very like um, lean, let's lean. say lean state when it comes to the state government. So, and how can you teach us about how it's lean? Yeah, sure. So, for example, in New Hampshire, there's no um, general sales tax on goods, and there is also no state income tax. There's like a capital gains tax, but no tax on regular income. No tax on regular income. Yeah. Um, None. Right. Exactly. I mean, it, you have to pay your federal tax. You have to pay federal. Yeah, but there's no state income tax. And no Medicare, Medicaid. Um, yeah, there's, those are all federal services, so you get all those. So you get those, but yeah. not state tax. So you're paying only what percent then total? Um, the, of whatever your, of your, your federal, check. whatever your federal tax whatever bracket is. Whatever federal tax yeah. bracket. So, um, so n that means that the state government largely um, resorts to property taxes. Um, uh, lo local oh, and state governments largely resort to and property capital taxes. Gains, you said. And there is a small capital gains tax, yeah. And there's also like um, a rooms and meals tax. So if you go to a restaurant, yeah. you're paying a sales, you're paying a tax on the food at the restaurant. And if you buy cigarettes, you're paying a state tax on the cigarettes. But there's no like, there's no like, interesting blanket sales tax. No blanket sales tax. Yeah. If I eat at a restaurant, I pay a tax. And if I get cigarettes, I would pay a tax. Yeah, stuff like that. Property tax is the and biggest, taxes. you think? Um, oh, source. yeah. Property yeah. taxes are like, and that's the thing that a lot of people complain about is they say, well, maybe if we had an income tax, our property taxes wouldn't be so high. Um, but I think that in state, I think that like historically states that implement um, an income tax with the idea that, oh, this will allow us to reduce property taxes, that doesn't actually happen. Um, the overall tax burden just goes up. So, and yeah. And then does, a, does relying on mostly property tax also potentially um, make it so that uh, the sliding scale of who pays the most taxes is a little more fair, those that have like really good land? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking at it from the perspective of what kind of taxes are the most justifiable, like morally, um, which is not a particularly, it's not really a consequentialist question. Well, you could be a consequentialist about it and say, like, um, a land value tax is the, causes the least amount of distortion, like okay. economic distortion and deadweight loss. So that's one reason to like land value taxes, which isn't quite, which isn't the same as property taxes, um, but it's in the sort of the same category, right? And then, but also from a um, uh, more of a deontological standpoint, which is where a lot of libertarians are coming from, I think that property tax is more justifiable because you're saying you can't come onto this land and the state is the one enforcing that people aren't allowed to trespass on this land that you've claimed. Although in theory, like, how did you get the right to that land? You know, it was, you go back far enough, it was taken from somebody else. Yeah, yeah. It was taken, it was taken out of the public commons and assigned to one person. And so you are restricting somebody's freedom of movement by claiming land as your own. So Interesting. some, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I'm very familiar with all the infighting amongst libertarians and anarchists um, and like pseudo anarchists and minarchists and all the little subgroups because I was embroiled in that um, culture in New Hampshire for several years. And that led you to decide to want to run? Well, I, um, I wanted to run for office because I wanted to, at the time, I wanted to reduce the suffering caused by government and I was focused on that suffering caused by government because yeah, yeah. I was an anarchist. And this is the criminal justice reform. And that's what, yes, and that's why I was focused on criminal justice reform is because our criminal justice system causes so much pain and suffering. And of course, I still do believe that. Um, and I think a lot of, um, I think a lot, if not a majority of prison sentences are unjustifiable. Um, and we're not focused on rehabilitating as much right. as we are just incarcerating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, um, everybody agrees that the incarceration 
rate in this country is out of control. Out of control. Yeah. I heard there's more people in jail here than in China. And China has like <laughs> four times the population of the United States. You mean total or per capita? Uh, to yeah, to total. That's, that wouldn't, yeah. uh, it wouldn't surprise me. It yeah. would not surprise me. Which is a crazy stat if that's, if that's, you know, if that's true, that's w with four times the population, how do we have more people in jail? That, uh, you know, yeah, it's pretty messed up. Yeah. Okay, so, so then, um, you know, your passion for criminal justice reform, you know, you took down prisons there. Um, I want to know, you know, at also kind of, you know, baking this into how you got involved in, in, in New Hampshire's legislature, but, but really just on a solving prisons, um, rehabilitating, yeah, what are your thoughts there? Oh, man. I think in general, when it comes to policy change, my experience anyway, is that it's easier to advocate at the margin for policies that reduce sentence length and keep people out of prison in the first place than it is to fix conditions in prisons um, because mm. uh, there's, um, it, when it, <laughs> Well, first of all, you can only you could only be an expert in one of these things. This is one of the things that I didn't really realize, is that you can either be um, is that learning about prison reform and beco and becoming the kind of person who can advocate for um, changes in the design and functioning um, and purpose of prisons is its own project and is separate from the question of should this be a crime and should people go to jail for it and so yeah. even though I see it as like par both of those things is are part of the broader issue of criminal justice reform is it was really hard to try to keep both of to um, keep both of those balls in the air that's what I found personally and also another issue is that when it comes to getting people to testify in favor of a bill it's really hard to get prisoners to testify because they're in prison. Yeah. Um, and um, usually for any misguided law, you can find somebody who would say, if I had ever been caught for this, I would be in jail, but I'm not in jail right now, mm -hmm. um, j like by the grace of God. You can find that kind of person. Yeah. But somebody who has, who has been caught and has been to jail is automatically less credible to legislators because legislators, wow. have, legislators tend to have a lot of faith in systems and in institutions. Uh, way too much faith in institutions because there's a selection effect where the kind of people who run for office are the kind of people who had relatively easy life so the institutions served them well wow yeah wow what did you call that effect the it's a selection a effect. selection effect yeah. yeah because in order to run for office it's more likely that you will be running for office if you have had uh, um, you know, middle class life. Yeah, a good life. A good yeah. life where you didn't have to struggle for food, um, yeah, or for uh, love or compassion, or for you know, or all these other basic needs, physiological needs that. Yeah. It's it's much yeah, and a lot of the time we need that. That's why potentially if we find people that are um, <clears throat> in the legislatures of the state and even at the in the co Congress level that it would be a profound shift in awareness for a country um, if they had a, 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 a more diverse um, socioeconomic us, um, if they mm -hmm. had, yeah, because then you gain the empathy from what it's like to, um, to be behind the eyes of someone that didn't come from that same homogenized yeah. background. Yeah, and I think this effect is even worse in New Hampshire because um, legislators are not really paid. They're paid $100 a year. A hundred dollars yes. a year. So it's mainly. So how do they live? Well, it's mainly retirees. Uh, I was supported by my wife, and I did like some side jobs and stuff like that. Um, but it's mainly retirees. The median age of the New Hampshire State House is sixty-seven. Wow. So these are people who had the financial well-being to retire. First yeah. of all, because yeah. some people never get to retire. Yeah. That, um, yeah. And people who you know, have the, the good health um, in their retirement to take on what is essentially a volunteer position. So that goes back to um,
people who had relatively easy lives, although I'm not saying every, I mean, really when you get right down to it, nobody has an easy life, but there's harder lives and easier lives, right? I really appreciated how, when you're describing about the prison system, that it's important to, you're juggling these balls and that, and you're talking about the extreme difficulty of the nuance and all the variables that are coming in, but really at a, at a, at a, at a perspective of, of what are, what is it, something ridiculous, like almost 50% of people are incarcerated in jails due to cannabis still or something egregious no, like that. No, it's not, it's not that high. It's not high. that high. Um, it's, uh, if you look at um, like drug related offenses, it's around 50%. Total but drug related offenses around 50%. I think so, yeah, if you include like jails and prisons. Um, and but cannabis is still like a good chunk of that. It's a, yeah, it's a good chunk, but it's nowhere close to 50% okay. of the total incarcerated population. I need to learn about that more. I went, I went, um, I was incarcerated uh, for four months for having cannabis in South Dakota. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this, these types of, yeah, because I always think about the lost potential. Um, yeah. Of oh the, yeah. The, and that's something that we don't track as a cost usually. We talk about, uh, like, one of the, there's the seen costs and the unseen costs. And one of the seen costs is like, well, how much does it cost to build a prison, you know, uh, pay the prison guards and stuff like that. But the costs that are almost never factored in is like the lost economic output of a person who is now, who cannot like contribute to the economy and generate value and generate wealth um, for himself and his community because he has this on his record. And it doesn't even take a conviction to do that. An arrest can do that. Yeah, the reform is so important. I'm, and, and I'm really excited to continue hearing about you know you and hopefully other people around the country that are working on this and around the world. Um, okay, so that was that was prisons, yeah. and we have other, you know, besides, you know, civil liberties, mm -hmm. harm reduction. And then the um, yeah. sex worker, sex worker decriminalization. Right. Yeah. Well, and the whole other thing was that um, I, when I won my primary in 2014, I was an anarchist. But then, by the time I was sworn in, I wasn't really anything anymore because I had this crisis of faith, um, and that's what led me to this community and this conference. Was I, um, I was questioning all of my beliefs because I wanted to do a jo good job. Um, at, uh, at decision making in policy. So um, that was pretty wild, getting sworn in and not really knowing, um, feeling like the ground was moving under my feet and like my dogma was insufficient and misguided, um, was a very uncertain time in my life. Well, yeah, <laughs> going from, yeah, and so you went from getting sworn in as, as an anarchist, feeling this, you know, ground shift from under you, and then you're surrounded by 67-year-olds on average? <laughs> yeah, I mean, by and large, I think a lot of people assume that it was really hard for me um, because I'm like a young woman. There was the occasional patronizing comment, but the thing that made it hard was that I had been this fringe activist. I had been arrested for civil disobedience. I had associated with the Free State Project. And that was um, because I had this dogma and this ideology that I didn't really question. Um, and when I, came, when I learned about uh, effective altruism and um, just like started examining my cognitive biases a lot more closely in general, I um, became, I, I shifted my focus. And I still, and criminal justice reform, thankfully was something that um, my old self cared about and my new self cared about. Like I checked all of my, all of my reasons for caring about criminal justice reform and they all still applied. Like yes, there is a vast amount of very expensive and very unnecessary suffering in this system. <laughs> like yes, yes, yes. That, that, uh, that still held. So at least I was still able to work on the primary issue that I had wanted to work on before I ran for office. Okay. So that was a relief. And so some of the ways that I did that was I helped people with their good ideas, like 
some of the good ideas were making Narcan available to, uh, like more available to third parties. Narcan immediately uh, reverses the effects of an opiate overdose. So, um, uh, so it's good to have that in as many people's hands as possible, pretty much, so that fewer people die of overdoses, um, which are themselves largely an artifact of the war on drugs and the inability to know what's in your, um, what's in your purchase, right? Uh, and then 911 immunity laws was another thing I helped out with, which is saying that if you call 911, you will not be arrested for drug possession and the person over having a medical emergency will not be arrested for drug possession. So, because people were scared to call 911 because they didn't want to go to jail. Yeah. Um, and so they would take out their friend's ID and, you know, put it somewhere easily visible, prop his body up, call 911 and leave, which is not, because that, I mean, that was the incentives was to get out of there before the cops and the EMTs get there. So 911 immunity laws um, make it less likely that people do that and um, more likely that people do call the ambulance. That's so. an, that's a that's a really important one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, I was a co-sponsor on both of those bills. Another bill that we got passed was we legalized needle exchanges. It was, um, uh, which our needle exchanges are um, robustly supported in the harm reduction and public health literature for reducing the spread of HIV and hepatitis. And also like interacting with a syringe service program um, makes people more likely to get help for their addiction issues. So um, even apart from the direct effects of there's less HIV, there's fewer, there are fewer hep C transmissions. There's the indirect effect of, well, and now people feel con connected and cared about by healthcare professionals, and so they get assistance. They get on, um, you know, a replacement therapy, like methadone replacement, or they, um, they seek the, the treatment model that wor would work best for them and where they are in their stage of life and in their stage of addiction. So anyway, just really, really basic stuff like that. Like we can't, we're not ending the war on drugs today, but we're going to make it more likely that people come out of it alive. Ending suffering was your big tag. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and apart from drug prohibition, which obviously there are a lot of politicians who oppose that. Not enough, but a lot of politicians who oppose that. Um, I read this report from Amnesty International that said that all governments worldwide should decriminalize all aspects of adult, uh, consensual adult sex work. Mm -hmm. And this was in agreement with the World Health Organization and um, with the UN Commission on HIV and AIDS that said that um, these these studies, these broad this broad consensus among public health experts um, and human rights advocates that sex work should be decriminalized. But there wasn't a single American politician who was willing to um, put their face to that policy. It was wow. Um, and I thought, well, I don't mind putting. I don't mind sticking my name on that and working on this. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that I became the best known for was um, uh, my advocacy for sex workers' rights. Uh, the, the bill, of course, didn't pass. It's uh, more of a 10 or 20 year project than a three or four year project. But um, my, my goal was to start the conversation. And we now have a few presidential candidates who are open about supporting sex work decriminalization. Yeah, so that's huge. I think I contributed to that momentum, which yeah. is a good feeling. Yeah, yeah. And then what would you say is the most important sort of um, takeaway, especially from um, the uh, sex work decriminalization? Oh gosh. For policymakers, I would say that arrest and incarceration are very blunt tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have lots of evidence that these tools are overused. 
in our current society. And so before you make something a crime, you need to have a really high bar for how certain you are that this is worth ruining a person's life and ruining their family's life. Um, and sex work criminalization does not meet that standard at all. Um, I think it's partially about what people choose to do their, with their bodies. It's a bodily sovereignty issue. Um, it's about control of female sexuality and, I mean, because most sex workers are female um, and um, the demonization of women who charge instead of uh, fitting into more traditional models of relationships and sexuality. Um, it's about criminalization of impoverished women because lots of women, uh, because sex work is um, something you can do with no education, right? So it's something that a lot of, and it's something that you can do um, without a lot of, like, there's a low barrier to entry. So um, it's a way of controlling and punishing women in poverty. And um, a lot of people point to the Nordic model and say, well, what if we just made it illegal for the people who are paying for it? And the answer is that the evidence doesn't really support that model um, because it makes it harder for sex workers to screen their clients. It makes it so that the police still see sex workers as um, contributing to a criminal enterprise. Even if they can't arrest the sex worker, they still see them as um, you know, collaborators in crime. So what you want is a, sec is a sex worker who can go to police when she's raped or robbed you can go, a sex worker can go to the police when she suspects that somebody in, uh, somebody is being trafficked. A sex worker who can, is happy and hopeful about going to the police when um, her friend doesn't show up the next day. Um, the homicide rate of U.S. sex workers is 200 per 100,000, which is wow. in just, it's basically unthinkable. Um, so I don't there's think, a lot of work to do. Yeah, I don't think I've ever, you know, you really unpacked it in the nuance really well there. It's obvious that you've been spending a lot of time thinking about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. And then you also, I don't think anyone's ever, you know, made it so clear that um, before someone um, makes something a crime, an officer makes something a crime to really think out um, the effect that it has on the person and the person's family. Uh, that's a really interesting way of yeah. seeing it. And if we can do um, uh, criminal justice reform um, to the point where, um, I'm interested to hear your take on this, but a lot of the, a lot of, uh, uh, the issues that civilization has in its code, um, we sometimes argue that if we were just to have slowed down and think better about how we want to you know, build the future, um, uh, in, a, in a way that where all physiological needs are met, everyone's able to creatively flourish, we're more spiritually enlightened, we're not violent against each other, these types of things. What do you think about that? Oh gosh, it sounds great. Um, I'm a little skeptical of utopian visions because, um, well, for a lot of reasons. I mean, first off, they were just so far away from anything like that. There's just still so much broken in this world. Um, so the gap between here and there, but also that a lot of utopian visions are, um, uh, when people try to um, enact them, there's often violence um, and sort of dystopian outcomes. I would love if people were more careful about institutional design. And I think that yeah. reforming the decision-making processes at institutions, even just to do like sort of basic, um, basic best practices when it comes to like a group decision. Like we know what makes groups make bad decisions, um, like conformity pressure for instance. And there are ways to reduce conformity pressure. But um, a lot of times this sort of like basic, how do we get this group to make a good choice? A lot of those, those, those things that we already know 
about social psychology are just not followed in public and private organizations. Um, I know they certainly were often not followed in committees in the New Hampshire legislature um, and are not followed in legislatures and committees and groups of policymakers all over the country and all over the world. So instead of imagining, and instead of thinking, oh, well, we can um, make sure everybody's needs are met and everybody is happy, um, I tr try to focus on a little smaller thing, like let's make people less reckless. <laughs> like just a, like, mm. l a little less reckless for right now. Oh, Because yeah. there's so much. That's a way to slowly yeah. kind of titrate <laughs> peace is by decreasing recklessness. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I like that a lot, Elizabeth. Two quick questions on sure. the way out. We like to ask these questions to our guests on yeah. the show. Um, first question is if you think we're in a simulation. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, mm, I'm going to say no. But... I understand the argument and I find the argument a bit unnerving. Yeah, we like to like to ask questions. It's a fun one. <laughs> it's a fun one. Um, and the other question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? My wife. Tell us why. She has these freckles all over her face and they even like extend onto her upper lip if you look really closely, which is so cute. And the way that she wakes up in the morning, like when the morning light is on her face and she has, it's like a, it's like a sunrise, like the, the pink, like the pink on her cheeks and like the really light purple bluish undertones under her eyes and like the like peachy complexion and her eyes are blue like the sky and so it's just like the sunrise on a human face um, and it's the face of the person that I married uh, and that I want to spend this entire lifetime with yeah. so I know that's a really cheesy answer but I, lo I love the way that you <laughs> describe such detail on the, on the yeah in the in, in your most beautiful thing yeah yeah Thank you so much for coming on our show and talking to us and teaching us. This has been so enlightening. You're very welcome. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Go and talk to more people about criminal justice reform and what exactly goes into deploying these types of changes into our world. Share with your friends, your family, communities, online, coworkers. Also, go and support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Support the organizations around the world that you believe in. Simulations links are below. Help us continue doing cool things like coming to Cambridge to conduct interviews. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. <laughs>